It's the Wilk Report. I'm Michael Wilk coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio, with a report about uh, the new Ghostbusters trailer, which I wanted to review for this channel, but my 007 reaction trailer got flagged by Universal. So, uh, you know, that's getting put through the ringer. Don't know if it's going to stay up, but yeah. So... Yeah, I, I can't review the trailer like I want it to, but I, I will link to it in the description below uh, so you can watch it and make your own judgments. Uh, but I wanted to do this article because uh, it, it, it just is so out of touch and elitist on so many levels that I, I just w was not able to let it go without making some kind of comment on it. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, enemy... Or, uh, yeah, NME, yeah. <laughs> nice uh, nice name for a, a publication. But basically, he's a clickbait pu pusher. He's not a journalist. He's a clickbait pusher, all right? That's how he makes his money. Uh, so his name is James McMahon. And if you haven't heard of him, you're not alone, because I never heard of him until today, which just goes to show you uh, how obscure he is, that he feels the need to try and make his fame by trolling people who are far more talented than he is. So he says, at that Ghostbusters trailer, you don't reward regressive fanboys. Okay, so this is from Bounding Into Comics uh, from December 9th, 2019. NME journalist James McMahon took to Twitter to decry the first Ghostbusters Afterlife trailer. He wrote on Twitter, at that Ghostbusters trailer, you don't reward regressive fanboys, many of whom were created a, an atmosphere of racist, misogynistic toxicity that led to a leading lady leaving this very platform by making the very film they wanted in the first place. And of course, because Bounding Edge Comics writers are stupid, he includes the tweet, uh, the original tweet that includes the word fuck in all its profane glory <laughs> without editing it out. So you, you edit it out of the headline and the quote, but then you leave it intact by linking directly to the tweet instead of uh, using a screen capture and editing that out. So and of course uh, McMahon wasn't alone in sharing his, uh, his rather droll opinion, but right. So uh, yeah, so basically he's saying you know, oh you don't reg regress the fanboys by giving them the movie they wanted. Yeah, you know I mean completely infantile. So, but you know he, here's the thing though he's defending a movie that l bombed at the box office for good reasons because it wasn't a very good movie. It sucked on many levels, and there are a number of writers who explain why, and I'm going to start with them. So on Medium.com, uh, Tony Zaret, uh, I'm not going to uh, go into complete uh, quoting on this one, just to give you an idea, though, because I'll link all this in the description below as usual, and you can read for yourself. Uh, but I want to quote this one. Uh, so let's start with the casting. While the poster advertises Kristen Wiig et al. being in the movie, what it doesn't tell you is that their only appearance is when a television plays in a, a television in a bar plays an episode of Saturday Night Live in the background. Instead, the actual star of the movie is none other than Mr. Gitter Dunn himself, Dan Larry the Cable Guy Whitney, playing four female characters in an Eddie Murphy-esque attempt at showing his range. This ex this is extremely problematic in my opinion, because both because the film would have been better served by casting one of the thousands of talented women in Hollywood, and because Mr. Cable Guy insisted on wearing blackface makeup to play a character with the unfortunate name Black Ghostbusters. Uh, so yeah, he's very brutal in his review. And, and again, I, I won't read from the whole thing, uh, but yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it's very damning that uh, you know all these contemporary reviews... Uh, blasted the movie on its merits and had nothing to do with uh, actual sexism. Uh, but then, of course, you get SlashFilm.com writer Peter Scaretta, who, uh, in his own scathing uh, critique, nevertheless tries to go out of his way to distance himself. And, and there's a reason uh, why I'm uh, making a point of this, uh, because you know, he's saying he's not a ghost bro, uh, that uh, he didn't think it was a bad movie. Well, yes, it was a bad movie doesn't matter what you think there dude it's a bad movie by any standard so uh but but he's trying to uh 
soft pedal his criticism by uh by you know trying to distance himself and say oh yeah i'm not one of these ghost bros who uh has been criticizing it just because it has a movie or a black woman uh you know, which i think is unnecessary and the the final person i'm, I'm gonna quote from uh, who reviewed the movie uh, was a lot more brutal and didn't even, even bother with all this uh, qualifying bullshit. So, um, all right. So, but here's a, the thing. Okay. So in Feig's Ghostbusters, the comedy rarely comes from the situations in the plot, which is what it's supposed to do, but instead from throwaway gags. At one point, a big gag is made about Chris Hemsworth is a character uh, wearing glasses without any lenses. And the gag comes about because the cinematographer decided, oh, I, I don't want a reflection on his glasses. So they just removed the lenses from the costume prop. And so they decided to just add that into the scene and make it meta. So, yeah, Hemsworth and Feet decided, OK, we're going to turn it into a joke in the movie. And thus a whole comedy sequence is born that has nothing to do with this character, the plot of the movie or anything. And that's basically what the movie is. It's just. It, th there's a bunch of throwaway gags uh, that they try to tie together and fail uh, and it just doesn't work all right and then of course you get uh, mercurynews.com which has a whole bunch of uh, images that no longer seem to show up but uh, but yeah this is by Tony Hicks uh, again contemporary to the release of the movie uh, but here, here's a damning line here. It's really too bad the stars of the new Ghostbusters got slimed by bad writing and a recycled concept. Even after seeing it, it's difficult to say what the movie is really about other than taking advantage of a proven brand name to make a studio some money. Nothing attached to the name Ghostbusters should come off so half-hearted. And that's the problem with the movie is that at no point... Did anyone involved in this in the reboot approach it with any degree of respect? And in, in fact, they actually had nothing but contempt for the original films. In fact, there's a, a scene uh, in the movie where Bill Murray's character, who plays a skeptic, is killed off in a, this uh, really disrespectful and, and humiliating manner. And Leslie Jones's character says, well, I guess he wasn't Ghostbusters material. So, you know, this review by Richard Roper from 2016, so bad. Ghostbusters is a horror from start to finish, and that's not me saying it's legitimately scary. More like I was horrified by what was transpiring on screen. So, uh... And, of course, he puts in a qualifier, how, how could so many talented, well-meaning artists who clearly loved and respected the original won't know they didn't. They hated the original and went out of their way to disrespect it at every turn. Uh, produce such a raggedy-looking, thuddingly unfunny, utterly unnecessary reboot. So, yeah, and then, of course, there's other things. Bad acting, uninspired directing, editing, cinematography, and music, cheesy special effects, a forgettable villain, a terrible script. So, yeah, uh, so this is from the Chicago Sun-Times. And, of course, Richard Roper was uh, Gene Siskel's replacement after he passed away, uh, with whom uh, Roger Ebert had teamed up. So, uh, and then, of course, the last review here from Jacobin Magazine, written by woman writer Eileen Jones, byline says, uh, the, the, the headline says fake controversy, terrible comedy, and the subheading says the new, Ghost, the new Ghostbusters isn't a feminist triumph, it's just a bad movie. And the opening paragraph, the new Ghostbusters will long be remembered as a feminist high point in American film history, proving that talented women can carry a big budget franchise film that was formerly a vehicle for male performers. No, I'm just kidding. The film's a forgettable piece of junk. Uh, it even looks like junk because director Paul Feig is so hell-bent on replicating a successful franchise, he apparently told the production designer to evoke the ugly 1980s look of the original mega-hit, including its cheesy, primitive, neon-colored CGI and special effects. Every set looks like it was built by high school students doing an I Ain't Afraid of No Ghosts prom theme. Yeah, pretty brutal. 
uh, because you know because all the male reviewers, if you notice, felt the need to add in qualifiers, you know, just to say that uh, they weren't ghost bros because you know they 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 they've been so conditioned to try and not offend people. Uh, just for being male, that they have to throw that in before they qual before they criticize a movie. Uh, and this one, no, no, absolutely not. She is just going to town and ripping this movie a new one. And she is, oh my god, dude, the, 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 she is brilliant. <laughs> and now she tears apart this movie and and why it's so forgettable and and awful, and also why Bridesmaids, which is uh, Paul Feig's twenty eleven. Uh, feminist triumph end quote uh yeah so yeah but uh yeah i guess it, uh people forget that the ghostbusters bruja is just a pumped up variation of the same publicity scam yeah she's not afraid to call it what it is publicity scam of smearing the audience for failing to like your terrible movie that attended the opening of bridesmaids 2011's feminist triumph a woman Center comedy, also directed by Paul Feig and starring Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy in a large female ensemble. According to the Bridesmaids Ballyhoo, if we didn't all go see it as an act of feminist solidarity, no Hollywood movie would ever again feature several women in lead roles. Women would virtually disappear from our screens and soon every American film would be reprehensible, a reprehensible sausage fest. Nothing but remakes of The Lusty Men, The Lost Boys, Young Guns, The Expendables, and The Dirty Dozen. But of course, nobody seems to remember the first Wives Club, which starred, among others, uh, Diane Keaton and Meg Ryan. And that was a female-led film. I saw it in the theaters. I loved it, actually. I thought it was great. Um, yeah, I mean, what do you, do you think it, a, a female-led movie can't work simply by being well-written and well-acted and well-executed? Come on, dude. I mean, so yeah, I mean, so... Yeah, Eileen Jones here is really uh, letting Paul Feig have it here for his uh, tendency to try and hide behind uh, fake allegations of sexism and racism to try and defend the indefensible. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so she's saying as a public service, I broke it down what people report they particularly enjoyed. Slime with its special appeal to children and young teens. Kate McKinnon's uh, punky, destructive joy in the role of tech geek, which has generated declarations of undying love. The movie's general silliness because everybody's so fed up with 2016, they're grateful for any distraction. And a nerdy villain who seems like the ghost bro type getting shot in the testicles. Still, as much as I want to be fair, I have to report the facts. <coughs> Ouch. Uh... So she says, it's a movie so incompetently made that nothing can save the comic actors trapped in it. All are made to look like under entertaining idiots, regardless of gender. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, and then she complains, you know, how Bill Murray, the way he was abused in that, uh, in that reboot uh, and wasn't even funny in it. Well, why would he be? Because the moment he got on set and started uh, reading his lines, he realized, oh shit, you're just trashing my character. Well, I'm not even going to put in any effort here. Because seriously, a, a man who can make any line hilarious, human sacrifice, cats and dogs living together, mass hysteria. You know, I mean, a, a comic genius who's so innately laugh inducing, he only has to stand there silently and look at sideways while rapidly blinking his eyes to make audiences roar, and yet he's as unfunny in this film as 80-year-old 80, 80 Bob Hope doing his thousandth USO tour. In Murray's small, stupidly written role as an effete debunker of the paranormal, he seems, for the first time, like a clueless has been in a silly hat, unable to land a single punchline. And that cameo is a riot compared to Aykroyd, so whole thing's a travesty, I tell you. Uh, but basically she, she puts the bulk of the blame on Katie Dippold and director Paul Feig, who ought to be written out of Hollywood on a rail. I concur. Uh, never mind the hideously boring third act of the movie in which we watch our heroines repeatedly blast a bunch of poorly rendered CGI ghosts. That's bad in a completely expected climatic action scene kind of way. Even before that, the slack script limps along with pathetically few laugh lines, but plenty of deadly exposition scenes. 
Just to watch Kristen Wiig cringe her way through a stilted monologue explaining her character's backstory, all about how she was bullied, bullied as a child for her belief in the paranormal and called Ghost Girl. She ought to sue. The plotting is relentless, starting with an interminable series of character introductions. Wake plays a Columbia University physics professor struggling to get tenure. In her execu- extensive opening scenes, she only has one decent line in, in response to what she thinks is her department chair's criticism of her absurdly prim bow tight outfit, too sexy for academia. After that, she still has to give a lengthy confrontation with her former partner in paranormal research, played by Melissa McCarthy, whom she deserted for legitimate science, and then meet that partner's new partner, the weird mobile techie Kate McKinnon, and then meet the subway worker who blathers pointlessly about New York City history. Poor Leslie Jones has cast a god-awful role, and god-awful acting from someone who was basically written to be a stereotype of a black of a loud, boisterous black woman with a few brains. And that's actually what people like James McMahon want you to overlook. Because if you compare Ernie Hudson's Winston Sedmore in the original Ghostbusters film, he did not play a stereotypical black man for comic relief. No, he actually played the straight man to the three eggheads, all right? He's the one who is there to ground the story in reality, okay, when they're in the jail cell. And, you know, spoilers for anyone who hasn't actually seen it, but there's a... Uh, there's a scene in in the original Ghostbusters where they've tried to uh, where you know that they, they've tried to go toe to toe with a guy from the Environmental Protection Agency and things go from bad to worse and they all end up in jail and they're explaining the situation uh, and what the stakes are and Ernie Hudson is saying, "Look, are you seriously going to go before a, a judge?" And explain that there's some moldy Babylonian god who's going to drop in on a, a high rise in Central Park West and start tearing up the city. And the guys correct him and say Samaria, not Babylonian. And he says, no offense, but I got to get my own lawyer because he realizes, you know, just where it's going to go if they go ahead and do that. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, and he's also the one who actually points out that the reason the Ghostbusters, you know, get so busy by the middle of the film with uh, ghost sightings that they have to take care of. Is because the dead have actually been rising from the grave in accordance with biblical prophecy. So, yeah, I mean, so, you know, Ernie Hudson's Winston Zedmore, you know, he's he's no comic relief in that film. He kind of was in the sequel, which, you know, is really disappointing. But, uh, you know, the, the, the sequel, yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, so basically... Uh, try and forget as much of that as you can. Uh, I mean, it's not that it's a bad movie per se. It's just, it, it was one of those sequels that probably wasn't as necessary in hindsight as, you know, you would think at the time. So, um, but then you watch Leslie Jones's character or her concept masquerading as a character, uh, to be more precise, uh, she just plays this stereotypical dumb black lady who's, you know, just loud and ignorant and uh, it just, just comes across very unlikable. So, you know, when James McMahon says, you know, fuck that Ghostbusters trailer, you don't reward regressive fanboys, what he's really saying is, fuck that goes, fuck the audience, you don't reward people who actually like the original Ghostbusters by giving them what they want. No, you have to go ahead and give them a, a movie that insults people's intelligence, that isn't funny, that isn't scary, that isn't uh, designed to please anyone except the director and writer of the movie. All at the same time, trying to you know, milk every last penny out of a franchise that really uh, was decades out of date. Because... Seriously, I mean, it had been almost 30 years since we had a, a Ghostbuster sequel, so it's not like there was a huge demand for one. I mean, yeah, I mean, Dan Aykroyd has been trying to get one put together along with the, the late Harold Ramis uh, until he passed away. Uh, so, I mean, 
So the chance to see all those uh, all the cast members on reunited on screen uh, for one last outing came and went, and then Paul Fee comes along uh, with a promise to resurrect the movie, and all he does is just disrespect the original two with a reboot that nobody asked for, and that was badly written, badly acted, badly directed, uh, just bad movie, period. And for this clickbait pusher, James McMahon, to go ahead and act as though it was only regressive fanboys criticizing it, and I've just shown you Five different reviews explaining that the movie was simply bad. It had nothing to do with having an all-female cast. It was just simply a bad movie. And you cannot call Eileen Jones of Jacob and Magazine some raging, misogynistic, racist fanboy. One, she's a woman. Two, Jacob and Magazine, if you're at all familiar with that, it's liberal socialist... uh, political content it's in no way conservative it's in no way racist or misogynistic or or anything like that so this idiot is lying and he knows he's lying i I mean just i mean and, and this is really what ticks me off because clickbait pushers like this try to lie to you and you know make their name by attacking people with far more talent and uh, honesty and integrity than he ever will. You know? So, I I don't know why he expects to try and... uh, and Because he's also, you know, he's trying to make his name by attacking Jason Reitman and the Ghostbusters sequel. And and, uh, I'm having flashbacks to when Leslie Jones was having her little Twitter tirade, you know, basically saying oh like we don't matter it's like well no you don't because you're 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 complaining that the direct sequel to ghostbusters and ghostbusters 2 acts like the reboot didn't happen well but the movie you were in acts like the original didn't happen so who are you to complain that uh oh my god but so so yeah i mean this is basically just people you know trying to salvage or or start their own worthless reputations on the back of something that is probably going to be a lot better than anything Paul Feig has ever done or ever will. Because the, the, you know he's a no-talent hack, much like Jar Jar Abrams, uh, much like Ruin Johnson, Michael Bay, Roland Emmerich, uh, any other number of, of no-talent assholes trying to make their fame and fortune by disrespecting uh, the original properties that they're adapting for reboots. So what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think I'm full of it? Do you think I'm onto something? Let me know in the comments. I want to hear from you. If you like what you've heard and you want to hear more, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon and select all to receive notifications whenever we upload new content. Like this video, share it to as many venues as you can. If you want to help support the channel, head over to our Patreon or subscribe to our page. I've also got a tech fundraiser in the link below. We can't do this without you. Until next time, this is Michael Wilk for The Wilk Report saying take care, good night, I'm out.